around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Lankford, and we'd like to welcome you today to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's Monday, September the 23rd, 2019. I trust and I pray that your heart, your life is touched by the power and by the presence of the Lord God of Abraham. There is nothing that can take the place of of God's presence. And I'm so glad that any time we desire to go into the presence of God through prayer, through the scriptures, through fasting, through singing, through music, through worship, we enter into his presence. And David said in Psalms chapter 16, verse 11, in thy presence is fullness of joy. It is when we get into the presence of God that God edifies us. The Holy Spirit touches us. The Holy Spirit strengthens us. The Holy Spirit revives and revamps our hearts, our lives, because without a doubt, the world as we know it is a perpetual draw on our spirituality. If your spirit is exhausted, if you are spiritually, emotionally drained, you feel very tired and weak in your body. But that's the power of the Holy Spirit of God to infuse edification, strength, encouragement in your mind and spirit and in your body to lift you above the shadows, to lift you above the darkness and the despair that Satan and this world has sought to bring into your life and bring about your demise. We, got, we have to remember, it's, it's imperative that we remember Satan comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If we ever lose sight of that, if we lose sight of that, then we won't understand when we are being assaulted, when we're being attacked by the enemy, where it's coming from. Satan steals, kills, and destroys. The great passage in Luke 22, 31, when Jesus said, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. He knew Peter would stumble and fall and falter along the way. But he said, Peter, I've prayed for you. The Greek says that Satan exceedingly demanded that Jesus give Peter or give him Peter's soul. Satan exceedingly demanded. He put a demand on Jesus. Give me Peter's soul. Exceedingly demanded that Christ surrender to him Peter's soul. But Jesus said, Peter, he's desired to sift you as wheat, to pierce, to riddle, to perforate your immortal soul. He's desired to do that to you. But I have prayed that your faith not fail. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Peter stumbled. Peter fell. He was a cursing, swearing, lying preacher. That was his humanity. 
But oh, after the day of Pentecost, that cursing, lying, swearing preacher became such a man of God. He did not care what the world said. He didn't care about imprisonment. He didn't care about any of those things anymore. Why? Jesus had risen from the dead. The tomb was empty. He knew there was eternal life and none other but Christ our Lord. Thus, his heart was fixed. His heart was set. It was set like in stone or granite. I'll not capitulate. I'll never give in again because greater is he that is now in me than he that is in the world. It was Satan of the world, the God of this world that sought his demise. But now the spirit of Christ, the risen Christ, the risen lamb, his spirit, the Holy Spirit now resides in us. It had taken a place of residence in the heart, in the life of the Apostle Peter. And because of that, he was well aware he could overcome, he could be victorious, he could defeat the devil and wouldn't have to live a life of failure, but rather a life of perpetual victory. And that is exactly what Christ desires for you today, and that is a life of of perpetual victory, and you can absolutely have that. If you so choose, you have to desire it, but you can certainly have it if you want it. God will not push anyone away, and there's always room for one more at his table. The old gospel song, there's room at the cross for you. Nothing could be truer today than that statement. There is room at the cross for you. We want to pick up today with the theme following the depravity of man, understanding coming to the knowledge of salvation. In Psalms chapter 3, verse 8, the psalmist declared, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation is a gift. Salvation is something that God has given to mankind through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Because salvation belongeth to the Lord, it's his divine possession, you have no claim. You have no stake. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself because it is a gift. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Remember, your salvation is a gift from God. That's why we magnify the grace of God in our lives. Because grace is that unmerited favor God does not owe man anything. Man was estranged from God. Man had no way to get back to God. And the only way for that to happen, the only way that that could take place is for God to give his only begotten son. Because you see, in every human being, there is a God part or a God particle, and that is your soul. God breathed into the nostrils of man, and man became a living soul. Now he has eternity abiding in him. But just because man had eternity, that did not resolve the problem of his separation from God. I've said this many times. It was a divine blessing from Jehovah. Elohim, to drive Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden for the express purpose of not allowing them to partake of the tree of life and live eternally in a fallen state. As we all get older, we have more aches and pains and problems and anomalies and aberrations in our body. How would you like to live like that forever and it only got worse? 
and there was never any way to be delivered. So God drove man from the garden, kept man from partaking of the tree of life, thus living eternally in a fallen state. But God had to get man back to himself in a redeemed state, a forgiven state, a reconciled state. God had to get man back to him. How would God do that? God's plan was his son, Jesus. Jesus Christ is the utmost expression of God Almighty. I'm not going to get into the theology today. It's too great, too grand, too glorious for human minds to understand the gravity of God. When you get to heaven, you're not going to see Father on the throne, Jesus on the throne, and the Holy Ghost on the throne. You're not going to see that. You're going to see one on the throne, Jesus. That does not take away from the omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence of God. One God, one Father. But he's, he is what is in the entirety of everything, yet Jesus is God. So how would God, in his august deity and majesty, how would God get man back to him? Because man, though he had a, and has a living soul, he's debased, he's depraved, he's debauched, he's filthy, he's immoral, he's sinful. How is God going to fix that and get man reconciled back to himself. That was the whole purpose for Christ coming. Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Jesus tasted death for every person. Why? So you wouldn't have to die lost. Now, we die. If the Lord tarries, we die a physical death. Well, well, if you're redeemed, you'll not die a spiritual death. As, as, as the Bible shows us in Revelation chapter 20, the second death, because that is a death where one is sentenced to eternal damnation and destruction from the everlasting presence and power of God. That's why Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. There are only two resurrections. Now, these little the prophecy teachers who run around telling you there's 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 resurrections, they're teaching heresy because that is total opposition against what Christ taught. Christ only taught two resurrections. John 5, 28, 29, Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Then you go to Revelation 20 and verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's the resurrection unto life. The second resurrection is the resurrection unto damnation and eternal separation from God. Now, if anybody's teaching any more resurrections than that, they're in error. I'm telling you, folks, we, 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 we don't make this stuff up like others make it. They just make stuff up. They, they just, I don't, I don't understand it. I, I just, I've quit trying to understand how much false doctrine men will create and make up so they can stay, quote, unquote, politically correct. What I teach, few people embrace and believe. But the Bible is clear in Matthew 24, 29. It will be after the great tribulation when Christ returns immediately 
after those days of the great tribulation, then shall appear the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. We, all we get then is just the sign. It's a process. I see Christ coming out of the heavens on something like a laser beam. And first there's the sign. Remember when he ascended in Acts chapter 1? He just kept getting higher and higher and higher, and he finally disappeared to the human eye. It'll be the same when he comes. The human eye will see such glory, light, and power. How do we know that? When Jesus returns, he destroys the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Brightness of his coming. I believe it will be so bright, you first won't be able to see Christ and the great white stallion. It will be so illuminous. But as he gets closer, the Bible said in Revelation 1 and 7, every eye shall see him. Now, what does that mean to me? It means he's now come to full focus relative to the human eye. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. Well, that's speaking of the Jewish people. They contributed to his death. Salvation. God brought you and I back through his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, David said, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. There's nothing you can do. I, I, I hate to tell you that. I know that disappoints some of you. There's not one thing you can do to save yourself. You're too pathetic. I'm too pathetic. I'm too pitiful. There's nothing I can do to save myself. And to think you can tells me you are blatantly deceived. You have been misled. For by grace... Are you saved through faith? Grace and your faith saves you. And that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, Brother Lankford, I did this. I done that. <laughs> yeah, people do Hail Marys. They do Hail Marys. They do the rosary. That don't save anybody. That's how subtle, how easily people become deceived in believing they have something to do with salvation when the Bible is clear. It is the gift of God and salvation belongeth to the Lord. Now, Isaiah 12 verse 3 says, Therefore with joy shall you draw waters from the wells of salvation. Now the wells of salvation symbolize a storehouse of God's many deliverances in the past, present, and future. Therefore, with joy shall you draw out of from the wells of salvation. The old country well, they dug a well, put blocks around it above ground, Put rock down in the bottom so the water could come up and be clean, not muddy, dirty. Put a roof over it. Put a bucket. Let it drop into the well. And they would draw it out with a crank. Crank it up. Draw it out. Pour out fresh water. Clean water. Beautiful water. What Isaiah is saying when he says, Therefore, with joy shall you draw from the wells of salvation. Everything that you need is in salvation. Let me say that again. Everything that you will ever need is in your salvation. Your healing, your physical healing, your emotional, your spiritual healing, all of that is in 
salvation, and Jesus paid for it all. You didn't do anything. You didn't pay for Jack. You'll never pay for anything. You can't buy God. You can't stake a claim on God. He paid the price in full, alone, by himself. Even in his atoning work. Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded, for he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Everything that was done to him physically was done to atone for your sin, even divine healing, restoration, redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation. Everything is in salvation, and thus you have no part in it. If you have any part in salvation, Jesus didn't pay the debt in full. He paid 99%. But you got to do this to get the fullness of it. That's baloney. That's hogwash. That's garbage. Yeah, I don't care if I make you mad today. I am sick and tired of people telling me, you got to do this and you got to do that. By grace and faith are you saved. That's it. By grace and by faith. That's it. When you get on your knees, a raunchy, randy, rancid, rank sinner, and you cry out to God, God, forgive me of my sin. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You get up transformed, changed by the power of the Holy Spirit of God through the vicarious, efficacious work that was wrought through the shedding of his blood on a place called Calvary. And Hebrews 9 and 22 says, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness of sin. Your sins are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. Your sins are not forgiven because you tithe or you fast or you pray or you get water baptized or you go to church or you help missionaries. That has nothing to do with salvation, nothing. It's that yet people are determined to add a little part to it. That's Phariseeism. That's legalism. You got to add, listen, there's not one jot. There's not one tittle. That's the, the, the Greek word is iota. Jot, iota, that one little mark, you've heard people say, I don't owe you one iota. That's the smallest part of the Hebrew alphabet. God says, I've paid it all. You don't do anything for salvation. Yet, we got all sorts of gimmicks. Hail Mary, rosary beads. So many things that man, I know what the problem is. I'm not stupid. You may think I'm stupid. I may act stupid. You may deem me to be stupid, but that's all right. But see, I know the truth. The person that was the biggest adulterer or adulteress that ever walked in shoe leather is no more damned to hell than a man that's never been born again and has never committed adultery. Both are damned to a devil's hell lost without God. It is men that try to measure sin. It is men that say, well, you know, now in Catholicism, you just do some more Hail Marys. And just do some more rosaries. You, you, you pray to Mary because the mother can get favors from her son. This will help you. That's baloney. I don't care who they venerate, who they, quote, unquote, make a saint. I'm a saint. <laughs> now, I know I just heard somebody say, a saint you ain't. I'm a saint because God has called us to be saints. You see, when he redeems you, you become a saint. That's why I loathe the statement, well, we're all sinners saved by grace. I'm not a sinner. I may sin. I may fall. I may miss the mark. I'm not a sinner. I'm a Christian. I'm a saint of God. You forget your status in Jesus Christ so easily. You forget that because men 
have held you hostage to denominationalism and denominational teachings. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Unto the church of God. That's not the one out of Cleveland. Not the one I think out of Indianapolis, Indiana. No, the church of God, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. With all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So we're already called to be saints. I don't need the Catholic Church to venerate me and make me a saint. I don't need that. Christ did that for me when I believed. I went from a rank sinner to a saint of God. You say, well, it just can't be that easy. I'm telling you, religious people will convolute Redemption and salvation to the degree it's almost impossible for you to get into heaven. Matthew 23, Jesus said, those that are going in, he said to the Pharisees, you're hindering, you're keeping them out. They're trying to get in, but you're making it so hard with this and that and this and that. I know the Bible says few there be that find it. It's, it's not a few because of that. It's few because the way is straight and narrow. That's why it's few. But then you have religious people who are have a spirit of religiosity. They don't see it. They can't discern it because it's got control of their lives. They think the things they do is what saves them and keeps them saved. Let me tell you, I don't trust David Langford because I can't keep David Langford, but I know who's the keeper of my soul. Now, by my willingness and desire to stay in the presence of God, that helps me crucify my flesh and say to my flesh, you're not going there today. You're not going to do that today. You're going to crucify your flesh. But the fact I stay in the presence of God, in the word of God, and I worship God in spirit and in truth, that's what keeps me on the straight and narrow path. That's what does it. Again, Jesus paid the price. Again, we get hung up in religion trappings. I, the older I get, the more I loathe denominationals, denominations and denominationalism. I, I, I loathe it. Because these men bring you into bondage. That's why you had the Pharisees. That's why you had the Sadducees. Matter of fact, there were no such things as Pharisees and Sadducees until they were released from the Babylonian captivity. Then they created these factions and these sects, S-E-C-T-S, sex. They created these sects, and in doing that, they made factions, and you're saying, oh, well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Pharisee. Well, bless God, I'm a Sadducee. Paul in Philippians 3, he says, as touching the law, he said, I'm a Pharisee. Hey, he, he admitted it. I'm just a religious bigot. He said, as touching the law, I'm a Pharisee. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Yep, I've been circumcised on the eighth day. But you know what he went on and said? I suffer the loss of all those things, do count them but dung, that I might know Jesus Christ. All that stuff is refuse, garbage, and filth. Look up the word dung in your strong exhaustive concordance. That's what Paul thought about religion and sectarianism. He said it's dung. I know that's made some of you mad because I'm, I'm implying your denomination has dung in it. Let's look at that. Let's take the time to look at the Apostles Paul's statement there about his life. See, this is what religion does to you, folks. Philippians 3 and 4. 
though I might also have confidence in the flesh. Now, I want to stop right there. Confidence in the flesh, confidence in what I've done, confidence in my works, confidence in my application, confidence in my understanding, baloney. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul said, you think you can trust in the flesh? Hey, buddy, Paul said, I got greater bragging rights than you do about trusting in the flesh. And he tells us why. He tells us why. Number one, I was circumcised the eighth day. That was the Levitical law. Eight means new beginnings. So they, they cut the foreskin off, circumcised him. He said, I'm of the stock of Israel. Man, don't you understand who I am? I'm of the seed of Abraham. Now, he's talking biologically, not the promised seed, because he wasn't born again yet. I'm not even a Jew. But because I am born again, I am now of the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3, 29. If ye are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Now, the Pharisees in, in, uh, in John chapter 8, they said we're Abraham's seed. Jesus said, I know you're Abraham's seed. He's talking physical, biological seed, insemination. I'm talking about the new birth, justified, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I look at that more than just seeing the kingdom of God in the sense of going to heaven. You can't see kingdom principles. You, you can't see how the system works in the kingdom of God because you're not born again. You're not born again because of what you did. You're born again because of what he did. Nicodemus was so carnal in mind, he said, hey, man, how am I going to get into my mother's womb the second time? How, how, how am I going to do this? I'm sure Jesus scratched his head and said, oh, me, how much do they have to learn till they learn the fundamentals? Philippians 3, verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am an elitist. Why? I stuttered under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the 35th in line from Mount Sinai to receive the law. He was a direct descendant of the law being passed down. He was nurtured and he was tutored and the tutelage, the tutelage was under the auspices of Gamaliel and that's who Paul studied under. So he said, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And when it comes to the law, <laughs> he said, I'm a Pharisee. Let me help you there. I'm a bigot. I'm self-righteous. I think I have something to do with my salvation. That's what he's saying. Concerning zeal, I was so zealous, I was blind, stupid, and ignorant. And because I was blind, zealous, stupid, and ignorant, I persecuted the church. Who's the church? The body of Christ. Why did Jesus say to Paul or Saul in Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Because the church is Jesus. The church is not the bride of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. When people rise up and say accusations against the church or against Christ, they're synonymous. Thus Paul says, persecuting the church. Jesus said, why you persecuting me. Why persecutest thou me? The church. Touching the law, or excuse me, touching the righteousness which is in the law. Now watch this. Now this is self-righteousness talking here about what he used to be. He said, as touching the law, I'm blameless. That's right. That's, that's self-aggrandizement, that's self-adulation, that's lifting oneself up 
And Paul thought he was getting somewhere because of what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Well, Brother Lankford, I am a minister in such and such denomination. I started out as a little lad, and I've climbed the ladder of success in my denomination, and I have gained so much. I now am the overseer of such and such denomination. I'm Daddy Rabbit. Sir, you still don't have anything. Why? But what things... Stop right there. Things. 1 John 2, 15, 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. But what things were gained to me? It's not about you. Paul understood that wasn't about him. It was about Jesus. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, he's magnifying the loss, magnifying the status quo. Yea, doubtless, and I count some things. No, that's not what it says, does it? Philippians 3, 8, that's not what it says. I count a few things. Well, I count certain things. No, that's not what he said. I count all things but loss. For the last 25 years of my life, I've been stripped with rapidity over and over and over and over again. Stripped. Stripped. I, too, once was the little golden boy in the church denomination. Going up the ladder of success. But then something got a hold of me. Straightened me out. Got me on the straight, narrow path and said, you're not going that direction. I got other plans for your life. Yea, Dallas, and I count all things but loss. Why did he count everything as a loss? All things, everything, all means everything. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Some of you wouldn't dare leave your denomination. You wouldn't leave your church. You wouldn't leave your organization because you don't really love the Lord like you say you do. I've been praying so much lately. I don't say that braggingly. God forgive me if I seem to be that way. I've been telling God I'll do anything. You, you tell me, maybe I'm not there yet. That's why he's not told me yet. The next move. Because I'm not there yet. But I'm praying. The Spirit of God has a way of getting your heart right. I said the Holy Ghost has a way of getting your heart right and moving you into a place where you will do whatever God wants you to do. And you don't care what men say. You don't care what the denomination says. If the Lord says, leave them, you say, okay, I'm out of here. Most people, oh, I can't leave. Why can't you leave? My grandpa was church of God. My daddy was church of God. I'm church of God. My children church of God. Guess what? Mine were too. But I left. See, Abraham had to leave. Tira, that was his dad. He left Tira. He left his family. He left following God, not knowing where he was going. That's where God wants to get you today, to a place you don't know where you are, but you know you're in Jesus. And that's all that matters. Either he's the God of all flesh or he's not the God of all flesh. Either God can furnish and prepare a table in the wilderness or God can't do it. Psalm 78, 19, I used that verse the other day. Can God 
prepare or furnish a table in the wilderness? Yes, he can. He can make water come out of a rock, make honey come out of a rock, make quail fall out of the air. I'm not talking about Steve either. He can, God can do anything. We see, we don't know that because we don't walk close enough with him to understand that. I have suffered the loss of everything, all things, and do count them but dung. Count them but dung. You mean being a Pharisee was dung? You tell me what Paul just said. He tells you who he was. He tells you now what he has become and why he has become that. The Greek says dung is that which is thrown to the dogs, i.e., that means that is refuse or dure, O R D U R E hyphen slash dung. I'll leave it at that. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as dung. You say, now, Brother Langford, my, my denomination, you, you can't say that about us. When you compare your little tenant, doctrine, dogma, syllabus to God. You don't really do that, do you? You don't really compare that to God because if you do, it's worse than filthy rags. Man, has the Holy Ghost tore up people's playhouse today. That's why I love the word and I love the liberty of the Holy Spirit. You never know how the Holy Ghost is going to take you and what he's going to say and what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. I didn't get past my first point today. Therefore, with joy shall you draw from the wells of salvation. It's his salvation. It is his redemption. Why do you think David there in Psalms 130, verse 6 and 7, he is plenteous in redemption. Whose redemption is it? It's his. It's not yours. I am redeemed, but I'm not my own. I've been bought with the price. Do you get what I'm saying today? You don't even own yourself. He owns you because he bought you through redemption. He brought you back to him. Are you, are you getting the message today? God owns everything. Psalms 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all them that dwell therein. God owns it all. You just don't know that. You think you own it. You, you don't know your Bible because if you understood your Bible correctly, you would know you are a mere steward. That's the best you'll ever be in the kingdom of God is a steward. Steward of your time. Steward of your talent. Steward of your earthly possessions. I've never seen a hearse, or excuse me, a U-Haul attached to a hearse when I was going to the graveside to bury somebody. My, my wife in April lost her mother. July lost her stepdad. Now they're executing the will. And guess what? She's got a little inheritance coming to her. But you know what? When we die, it's going to go to our children. You don't own anything. Don't, don't fool yourself and sit back on your laurels and say, hey, man, look at what I got. Jeffrey Epstein. I don't believe he hung himself. They killed him. They murdered him. He knew too much. But they talked about the mansions, the, the island he owned. 
the jet airplanes, the wealth. I think he was worth $800 million, nearly a billion dollars. And I thought, where did he go when he died? Where did he go when he died? Where did he go? The island is still in the sea. The mansions are still where he left them because you don't take it with you when you go. It's left right where it was. You're just a steward. When you have been redeemed, it's Jesus Christ who paid the ransom. Jesus paid the ransom in full. Jesus himself bought and paid for all men's salvation. Now, whether they accept the grace of God, whether they accept the gift of God is another thing. We're sitting here trying to remember the verse in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, he paid the price for all, but he will only ransom, buy back so many because they won't come to the saving grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he gave his life a ransom for many. Why? Because not everyone is going to accept salvation. How many times, and I know I'm old school and I'm proud of it. I'm glad I know the truth. I've ministered and I've preached thousands of sermons, been in thousands of Holy Ghost Spirit-filled services, and I've watched people be under such grave conviction and still get up and walk out on God and not repent. I've seen it. I've seen them die. I've had to preach funerals. I, I, I just, if I could have found a hole and got in it and covered myself up with dirt, I would have done it. Not to have had to stand there and preach that person's funeral, whether it's a teenager, uh, a young adult, or a middle-aged person, or whatever. When, when people die lost without God, you have no idea the burden, the pressure, the anxiety, the anguish in my soul having to minister to the family in behalf of the decedent. Because my thought is, God, did they make it? When they put a gun to their head and blow out their brains, God, did they make it? When a 16-year-old kid on a motorcycle and his 15-year-old girlfriend on the back of it, and they T-bone a car doing 100 miles an hour, and they fly 100 yards nearly down the highway when they go over the top of the car. And I've, and I've warned them, don't do that. I'll never forget telling that young lady in the high school, if I, Christian school, when I passed her to Charlotte, I said, don't get on the motorcycle with David. His name was David, just like me. I said, don't get on that motorcycle. Please promise me. I promise, Pastor, I won't do it. I won't do it. Two weeks later, she was dead. Dead. Three blocks from her house, but she was dead. People play with God. There's no doubt in my mind, somewhere along life's road, the Holy Ghost pierced the heart of Jeffrey Epstein and said, Son, you need to get it right. You need to get it right. Father, today, I sense in my spirit the Holy Ghost of God is trying to speak to someone's heart to get it right. The Bible declares in Proverbs 27, verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Lord, I don't know about tomorrow 
I don't know those that are listening right now to this broadcast what tomorrow may bring forth for their lives. All I know is that you say unto men, today is the day of salvation, and we are to repent. We are to repent when the Holy Spirit of God quickens us and deals with us relative to our sins. Father, I ask today that the Spirit of grace, the power of God, would search out the lost, the destitute, the dying, the desolate. Lord, you know the souls that are listening to this broadcast this 23rd day of September. You know the soul that is nearest eternity. I don't know them, but you know them. You know every hair that is on their head and you know how nigh, how near, how close they are to eternity. I pray the grace of the living God to abound so powerfully that conviction would smite their hearts and they would repent of their sins so they might come to the saving grace and the knowledge of your son, Jesus. Let not the ministry of your word today be in vain, but let the ministry of the word burst and crush the stony heart and that it might return to a heart of flesh and seek forgiveness and repentance through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Help none of us to be so naive and so arrogant that we feel, we think, we believe we have something to do with redemption. We were utterly and totally lost and by, by the grace of God, we were saved from our sins. Father, I thank you today for the anointing. I thank you for the power of your word that pierces and cuts, reproves, rebukes, and corrects men and women of their sins. Take this broadcast and use it for the glory of God and for the edification of the body. Whether we all need to be reproved and rebuked, so be it, Lord. We need your touch, your power in our hearts and in our lives. Help us to see the way as you see it. Help us to understand, to know, to discern the hour, O oh God. For I believe the next 12 to 14 months are some of the most dangerous and tenuous months for this nation. God be our refuge and strength and present help in trouble. I humbly ask for your covering today, Father. Bless the voice of evangelism. Bless those who stand with us and help us to do your work, Lord. Let not your word return void, but let it accomplish that which will please you and prosper in the thing whereunto that you send it, Father. And we'll ask it all in the name of your Son, Jesus, the Lord's Christ. God bless you. Have a great evening. Have a great remainder of the day. I'll be back here tomorrow to share once again an uncompromising message from the Word of the living God. Until next, till tomorrow, walk by faith and trust in God. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.